Good evening, brothers and sisters in Dharma. <clears throat> Tonight we are having a medi evening meditation talk and Q&A, followed by Q&A. Uh, the title is Relax and Grow. So, Bhante Chunda, is from, he was from Ipoh. Uh, he was born in 1976 in Malaysia and migrated to Christmas Islands at a very young age. Bhante spent most of his youth between Christmas Island and Perth. At the age of 23, Bhante Chunda was attracted to the teachings of the Buddha and began practicing under Acham Brahm's guidance. He joined his teacher in Bodhiyana Monastery in 2008 to become a Buddhist monk. Bhante Bodhidharma was born in Switzerland in 1982 to Czech immigrants. At the age of 21, he temporarily ordained in Bangalore, India under the late Acharya Buddha Rakita and was given the Buddhist name of Bodhidharma. After staying in Bodhiyana Monastery for the Rains Retreat in 2009, he returned a year later to take up monastic training with Acham Brahm as his teacher. The two Bhantes are here for a week until Monday, so please feel free to come and uh, offer breakfast dana at 7.30 and uh, lunch dana at 11.30. And also this Thursday, the Bhantes are doing a one-day meditation retreat here. So if you'd like to join in, you still can. Okay? <clears throat> but uh, do register so I know the number of packs. So uh, I'll pass it over to Bhante. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's working. Right. Yeah. Okay. So good evening to everyone. And it's great to be back in uh, Malaysia again. Because I haven't been back to Malaysia for quite a while. Uh, I think the last time I was back here that was about close to nine over nine years ago that, and I was I visited BTF uh, in the old center uh, twice. Uh. So it's great to be back here again uh, um, to see this new this quite beautiful new center. Uh. Yes. So uh, I noticed things have changed a lot. Uh. Um, there's more buildings in K in KL. Uh. And um, yeah, more traffic. More, more traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the way back here, we, we got stuck. Uh, I realized, well, okay, this is KL traffic. Uh, <laughs> expected, uh, and I noticed it was a bit hotter than normal. Uh, yeah. So this time coming back, it uh, was basically, um, I think some supporters that came to um, Bodhiyama Monastery and they asked me when I'm coming back to um, PGF again. Uh, I said, mm, maybe, uh, maybe I might come over. Uh, in 2020 or 21 uh, but you know what happened COVID happened uh, and yeah so that <laughs> we didn't have the opportunity to come over during that time uh, but since COVID is over I kept my promise to come back to um, uh, Malaysia and to visit uh, BGF uh, so yeah I'm uh, really happy and a great honor to be back here uh, and also because it's Jingming um, next week uh, so um, my parents is coming here too. So I decided to come over at the same time to see my grandmother. She's about 84. So I don't not not, not sure how long eh, I can keep on um, disposing my time not to see her. Eh. So so I say, okay, this time I'll come back, see my grandparents. Um, yeah, go to the graves with my parents, um, see my grandparents' uh, graves. Um, and also to, yeah, Come, come to um, Malaysia and help to do some teaching. Yeah? And I have asked my, my fellow uh, monastic friend, Venerable Bodhicatta, uh, to come over at the same time uh, and also to check out the, the um, Dharma scene in Malaysia. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I've been a monk for about 12 years and um, it's been a very interesting um, journey and experience uh, because um, when I was quite young, um, yeah, I was experiencing a lot of stress, anxiety, worry, fear, um, quite anxious. Uh. So when I first came across Buddhism, uh, it actually gave me a really strong guideline uh, to practice uh, the, uh, the, um, the Buddhist path. Uh. So yeah, so I was working up in the mines, and you know how things are like at the mines, uh, you see a lot of men and um, they tend to drink a lot and um, yeah, I got into a lot of bad habits uh, 
and um, it slowly created. I saw you have a lot of anxiety and worry rise in my heart. Right? So when I started doing meditation, it actually helped me to um, let go of a lot of my anxiety, uh, inner unhappiness. Uh, so when I started doing loving kindness meditation and um, and also samadhi meditation, I find that my happiness increased and my health increased at the same time. Because I used to, my hands used to tremble and I can't sleep properly here at night. Yeah? So sometimes I stay awake up to like maybe the whole day, whole night yeah? and up to sometimes the longest two weeks. Yeah? So yeah, so I was um, my busy mind was keeping me away. Yeah? So when I came across meditation, uh, that really helped me uh, just to calm and make the mind peaceful. Uh. When that happened, uh, I, I noticed a few things happened. My hand stopped shaking, uh, my eyesight improved, and um, yeah, and my hearing also improved. Uh, yep. And also I find that my headache also slightly went away. Uh, yeah. Before that, uh, it felt like someone pressing my head all the time. Uh. So, so I got quite interested uh, in meditation. Uh, so I was quite keen to, uh, to uh, go and visit the monastery, ask Ashen Brown for more questions, uh, and basically ordain in the future. Uh. But my parents say, I did ask my parents if I can ordain. Uh, and my parents say, no, you can't ordain. You're still young, and you just finished your study, uh, and you just started work. So basically, you have to stay and take care of the, the family. Uh. So I decided, OK. I listen to my parents, uh, I'll respect them. Uh, so I stay as a layperson, practice for 10 years, but I still go to the monastery quite often. Uh, so after 10 years, I ask my parents if I can ordain. And my parents say, mm, no. I say, okay, another 10 years? And they say, yes, another 10 years. I go, okay, so I'll, I'll wait for another 10 years, uh, then I ask if I can ordain again. Uh, and my mom say, no. After 10 years, the answer is no, you can't ordain. I go, oh, so when I'm all day, and my parents say, only when they pass away, then I go all day. And I say, that's not fair. Huh? What happens if, if, I, if I pass away <laughs> later my parents? So I did think about it for quite a while, huh? for maybe a month. <coughs> then I realized, no, I have two brothers and one sister. Huh? So they're going to take care of my parents. Huh? So I think when they have that. Huh? to um, Bodhiyana Monastery yeah? and later on to ordain. Yeah? So I did ordain as a novice first um, without my parents' permission. But when my parents came and visited me and noticed I was very happy here. Yeah? So later on he decided to uh, let me ordain as a cooler. So things do work out. Yeah? So it's good. It's been a very interesting journey. Yeah. 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 So I thought maybe I'd just do some meditation get my samadhi together uh, and um, maybe go back to my life uh, so I can have the best of both worlds. Uh. But I realize that uh, sometimes when you practice and uh, as a monastic, you can basically go and help a lot of people uh, th that is interested in uh, meditation and dharma practice. Uh. So I realized at that time, uh, yeah, we are very few monks and um, yeah, monastic, being a mon monastic, uh, and practicing the, the Eightfold Path, uh, the Holy Path, is actually quite rare. Uh, and uh, if I have the ability uh, to practice and to help people uh, um, around the place in my community, uh, then it's quite precious. Uh. But Sajid Brandy told me, uh, if I do do well, then it can be a great benefit uh, to a lot of people. Uh, just help people one at a time. Uh. I thought Ajahn Brown was pretty much late. Uh, but later on, when I first came here, uh, to uh, BF, uh, when I was a novice, uh, did a retreat uh, with one of my fellow monks. Uh, and a few people they came up to me, asked some questions, uh, and they say that my questions, my answers, have been very uh, useful. Uh, and they did help them uh, to overcome a lot of their own suffering. Uh. So I realized, wow, okay, I'm a novice, uh, and I can help people uh, one by one. Uh. So I felt, okay, it's actually quite good. Uh, because when you share the teaching, uh, um, you learn and also the other people learn uh. so basically we all grow together uh. but as a monastic uh, I find that when you do learn uh, you tend to develop more wisdom uh. so I realize teaching is can be a very powerful beneficial uh, 
path to practice that. When I was in Perth, you see we go to many different places. We go to um, the Armadillo med meditation class next to the hospital. So we do have a lot of new um, meditators coming for the first time. And um, they say that uh, my guidance in meditation is pretty good. It does help them quite a lot. So I realized, wow, well, okay, we just do one thing at a time. And uh, people do benefit. Like the doctor's feedback was spacey. People that come for the meditation, they tend to improve a lot more faster uh, than people that don't come for the meditation. Uh. So there's a lot of benefit uh, in basically calming is doing the body and mind. Uh. So yeah, so that's one thing I noticed uh, that people who come for the meditation class, they tend to improve. Uh, because same for myself, my, my health was not that good. Uh, but when I started doing my me meditation, uh, then yeah, the headache, the um, the worry and anxiety went away. Yeah, since being a monastic, I've been I only been sick maybe once. <laughs> so yeah, so it does keep um, have the ability yeah, to maintain a healthy heart and mind. Yeah, yeah. so hmm, it's quite interesting because I, I realize wherever I travel, um, yeah, there's always um, a lot of anxiety and worry. Yeah. Even when I went down to um, Margaret River, we have a, a small center down there that the monks invite. They're delayed to invite the monks to come over quite often. Eh? So um, when I went, first went there for the first time, eh, we went to Bodhi Dutch eh? There was a group of um, Westerners doing meditation retreat. Eh? Then I realized they are going through a lot of hardship. Eh? But in a small community, you see when people work, they work very hard. And as they get older, then some of the family members start passing away. Then they, they get sick quite often with um, sickness and cancer. Uh. So then I can understand how difficult it is uh, to um, not able uh, to understand what's happening with the body and the mind uh, through, um, through just having no resources. So having Buddhist monk there, because we went there and there was some practitioner there was a learning meditation from books and tapes. Uh. So I mean, was around there, it was quite a good experience uh, because you realize you can give a, a lot of good feedback and guidance. Uh, and uh, with lay people, they really appreciate having monks around. Uh. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll pass the, the any, anything you'd like to add by the Well, oops, there we go. Yeah, you actually said a lot already. I'm not quite sure <laughs> where I shall start, but probably we still have a little bit of time before we meditate together. So I might just mention where the title comes from. You might be wondering, you know, usually you have to just choose some kind of title for the talk and then hope that you're going to be talking about that more or less. <laughs> so you, you choose a generic title. Um, but one that we've been using for the retreats we conduct over in Australia, which kind of stuck is relax and grow. And sometimes people ask, yes, the relaxation, I guess most people get the idea there, but it is actually a very, very important part because we think that we have to strive for things. We think we have to figure out things. We have to put forth a lot of effort. And that is true in our day-to-day -day lives, but very often, even in our day-to-day -day lives, we have to make sure that it is wise effort and that we are not wasting our energy. But especially in meditation, if we are too forceful, um, then we actually tire ourselves out and then we can't experience um, the meditation as well as we could otherwise. So we try and we try and we try and we tire ourselves out. Ajahn Brahm comes and teaches um, all over the place and uh, I can't remember where it was. Was it in Singapore maybe the first time where he heard it? Uh, people came up uh, during the interviews and were asking him about Samadhi headache. And he was saying, what the heck is that? <laughs> I've never heard about Samadhi headache before because Samadhi is stilling the mind. It's relaxing to the max as he says. So, but he thought about it for a little while and then he realized, ah, okay, it is this striving, it's this effort, this idea that the people have how they 
are supposed to achieve things in meditation. And very often he says they have their eyes closed. But if we could kind of open their eyes or just open the eyelids and see what's happening, they are told to watch their breath. And what happens is they do this. <laughs> the eyes <laughs> get crossed because they are watching the breath physically and straining their eyes. And no wonder if you do that for very long, then you actually get a headache. So relaxation is really, really important. And Ajahn Brahm actually always teaches a body scan for that reason as well. So the body is one of those pot, um, objects which is a bit coarser than, say, the breath, for example, and that we can more easily settle on, that we are more familiar with as well in our day-to-day -day lives. And then he spends quite a bit of time with the body. And the good thing with the body is that we can receive feedback from the body quite easily. So if we are putting in too much effort, if we are striving, if we are trying, and we have enough mindfulness, enough awareness to feel what's going on, then we will realize that there is tension. And that's when we realize that awareness is not enough, that we actually also need kindness to release that tension, to meet that tension, to deeply relax. And that's when Ajahn Brahm coined the term that everyone here probably knows, kindfulness. So it's the mindfulness, the awareness, gently putting your mind on the object, whatever that is, usually the body in the beginning, and then being very kind and being very gentle with that object. That's the relaxation part. And now when we do that with relaxation, there is joy and there is happiness that arises. When that relaxation isn't there, then usually what happens is stress, anxiety, tension, um, worry, all those things that basically tire us out. But with joy and with happiness, there also comes a certain natural wakefulness and there comes a natural interest in what we are doing as well. And the interest will allow you to settle on the meditation object, which in the beginning is the body. And then the meditation takes care of itself. Then the meditation is carried by that kindness, is enhanced by that, um, by that joy. And it doesn't have to be a very strong joy, but if we are mindful enough, if we are aware enough, then we will find it in there somewhere. And if we are able to give it room, to give it space, to allow it to live in our own heart, to live in our own mind, to nourish it, to grow it, <laughs> that's now the second part there, then that will really take care of the whole journey for us. So the growing part, so the relaxing part first, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we avoid the unwholesome mind states and that we overcome the unwholesome mind states. Um, the best way to do that is with wisdom. But usually, if we don't have enough mindfulness and if we're not kind, then the wisdom is not really available to us. So we want to make sure that we grow the wholesome mind states, that we cultivate them and that we maintain them in our own hearts. And that's what um, the growing part is. Maybe one thing that just came to my mind that I wanted to mention before we do the meditation together um, is I was just staying in the monasteries in Thailand and I was just uh, reminded of it because we have one gentleman here who temporarily ordained at Wat Mark Jan in Ajahn Anand's monastery and uh, we actually met there. So um, it was the first time for me to be in Thailand, even though I come from the Thai forest tradition, and to go to Wat Pa Pong, where Ajahn Chah was, and to get a feeling for um, you know, some of the stories that Ajahn Brahm tells. 
And one of the stories that I wanted to share that I felt kind of fits in here is how Ajahn Chah would go to the houses and bless them or go to a house dana or when people would come to the monastery and he would give them a blessing and uh, I don't know maybe Ajahn Brahm does it here for fun and games as well a little bit so in Thailand they have the tradition to have the holy water and to sprinkle the holy water on people and so um, our monastics do that as well and sometimes people wonder you know what is the power of the holy water and how does this all work and Ajahn Brahmali has a very nice way to explain this he also says you know we give you the holy water to remind you of things and those things are the things that Ajahn Chah was talking about so when he would give a blessing with the water he would say the water has four beautiful qualities and they are basically the qualities of the Dhamma and the Dhamma needs to be practiced we can't give the Dhamma to you we can inspire you we can guide you but it actually needs to be developed to grow, be grown in your own heart and when that happens then those four qualities will start to grow to establish themselves and then to overflow out from you into the whole community into your family and into the the whole world basically so the first quality is coolness they will understand that very well <laughs> in a country where it's hot so when it's hot and when we are thirsty then we get some water and we use the water to cool ourselves down so that's the first quality and that's the first blessing of water and the first blessing of the Dhamma so we cool down all those mental irritations all those mental defilements all the fires all the heat of of anger of wanting something very strongly of being confused of trying to figure things out so that gets cool down and calm down so first quality coolness second quality is purity how do we wash our clothes we take some water we need a bit of detergent as well which helps <laughs> but the water is the agent which helps us to purify which helps us to clean and the Dhamma the path the practice is the purification of our minds is the purification of our hearts that we do with the right sila with the right way of being in the world and um, then also of course with meditation so when we have a pure conduct then we are happy meditation becomes easier and the purification of the mind can even become deeper in that um, aspect and then we have number three that is growth or prosperity so we have some plants in the back there so they need water and again they also need some nutrients but water is the agent water solves the nutrients brings them into the soil brings them into the roots and allows growth to happen so the Dhamma will also help us to grow and to prosper and then the last one which um, was quite an interesting one for me um, is the ability of the water to um, bind things uh, what's the English word again we learned it in biology um, that the water actually is like one string of water and it gets sucked up into the plant but n now it's cohesion cohesion is the word so it um, binds together and if you want to have a picture to understand this if you have flour and you have all this you know little pieces and you take some water and it binds everything together and makes a nice smooth dough and that is the quality of harmony that is the quality of peace and that's where harmony and peace comes from if we use the Dhamma in the right way and use all those beautiful qualities that were mentioned before then we can actually create peace and harmony in our own body in our own mind in our family and hopefully on some stage also that will flow out into our world okay so that's a few words 
to describe a little bit what relaxing and growing might mean. But probably it's the best if we put it in practice now and meditate together. Do we normally dim down the light? Okay, so before we start the meditation, always remind yourself the effort is not like the word like concentrate can be too strong because when we concentrate and we put a lot of effort and force. But I like to use the word mindful. When you're mindful, you know. So if you're mindful now, you're mindful of my speech, what I'm saying. And if you're mindful, you're mindful on that you're sitting on the chair. Yeah. So that's the amount of mindfulness that you need. Just mindful that you're sitting on the chair. And also, you're gently bring your awareness, then you're mindful that you're breathing in and out. So that's the amount of effort, uh, just to know what is happening. Okay, so we will just see comfortably. And gently bring your mindfulness to your face. And gently bring, close your eye. And just breathe in and out, normally, calmly, peacefully. And it's always good to always try and ground your awareness or your mindfulness in your body first, just to relax the body. So we start off being mindful of our head, relax our forehead, then we bring awareness to our face and we relax our face, we relax our jaw and now we bring awareness gently to our throat and we relax our throat. Our neck should be nice and straight and also reach it. Then we relax our neck. And now we gently bring awareness to our upper body. So it's a way our upper body can be stiff. Just relax our arm socket. Both of them. So it's not too raised, but nice and relaxed. If you need to, you can bring awareness to your right arm. And if you need to, just gently move it around, make it comfortable, and relax your right arm. And now we do the same with our left arm. We bring awareness to our left arm and just relax. Relax the arm. And if you need to, please move me constantly and relax both our arms. And now we bring awareness to both our hands. And if you need to, please move it around and relax our hands and fingers. And now we bring awareness back our spine. Our spine should be nice and straight and not too rigid. And we relax our spine from the top and slowly move your way down to the middle, relaxing our spine all the way down to our lower back. Then sitting on the floor or chair. And if you need to, please move it around and relax our lower back. 
can shift around, loosening and relax our right leg, and same with our left leg, move it around, make it comfortable, and relax our left leg, and finally, we bring awareness to both our feet, if you need to, please move it around, make it loose and comfortable and relax both our feet, our soul and our toe. We've been so 
Just allow the mind to relax and make peace with the moment. Enjoy the quiet moment in this room.
relax more if you read it. So we will finish this meditation class now. So it's fully come out of meditation. <coughs> It's always good just to um, have a break, uh, relax his body, and calm the mind down. Because we do live a very busy schedule, and um, we do need a break uh, time to time. Uh, because um, I find meditation is something like um, when we're tired, when we just came back from work, sometimes we take a shower just to clean this body. Uh, so same with meditation, we are very tired, exhausted, and the mind has been very busy working, uh, planning, and uh, dealing with a lot of problems. Uh. So it's good to uh, give this mind and this body a break. Uh. So it's almost like a mental shower. Uh. Let's give it a clean and, and a relax this mind. Uh. Also, I forgot to mention, uh, if you're not used to um, sitting on the floor, next time you can please sit, sit on the chair. Because at the retreat center, those that have been at the retreat, retreat center in Perth, we don't have more chairs in the retreat center. And um, the chairs are usually the first to be all taken uh, when there's a retreat. Uh, because regardless if you're sitting on the floor or sitting on the chair, uh, you can still get into a very quiet, peaceful and deep meditation. Uh, the meditation is not using wu power. It's basically just learning to relax, to calm, to give this body a rest, to allow it to regenerate and heal, and also to allow the mind to just bring back that mental energy. Because the more you calm, the more you can still the mind, then the power of awareness will just arise naturally. So the more we can let go, the boy can calm the mind, then the mind will come slowly become more alert and more mindful. It's like you become alive again. So that's why a lot of people they love to go um, um, rock climbing because I saw a documentary where people go free um, freestyle rock climbing where they climb the rock we are on the safety safety line and people are saying why you do things like that? And the, um, the extreme uh, people that play that kind of sport, they say when they climb those rocks, uh, they have to be really mindful uh, and fully aware uh, where they put their hand and leg uh, to push the tail up. Uh. If they're not mindful, uh, they'll fall straight down. Uh, and it's quite ex a extreme dangerous sport. Uh, and I don't know why people does that. Uh, but one thing that I always remember, uh, they say that once they finish climbing, uh, it's like, they feel so relaxed and peaceful uh, because the mind is the mind is just so fully aware and mindful uh, every step uh, they, they, they say they feel a lot of peace and joy uh, while just climbing uh. so I find that that's quite extreme way uh, to calm the mind uh, and bring a lot of mindfulness uh. so meditation is a lot more safer way uh, of doing that kind of practice uh. okay so I'll open to the um, to the <coughs> to the attendants, is there, is there any question they like to ask? Sir? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes, we have two mics here. Yes, so we have to share one less, but uh, no problem. Thanks. <coughs> Good 
put up your hands if you have questions. I bring the mic to you. It's okay. It's either people are really relaxed or, um, or my, my guidance is really, really bad. <laughs> Bhante, probably we are too shy to ask. Huh? On one hand, you're talking about relax, relax. Mm -hmm. When we're sitting quietly, yes. uh, in the mind, is, you know. So uh, the mind is not not relaxed and not calm. You know? mm -hmm. You're running here, running there, and then the only thing that you can feel is that you are quiet. You 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 sitting down, not doing anything, because mm -hmm. in our daily life we'll be running here and there, everywhere. Other than that, as you say, you relax, relax, but never seems to be relaxing. Yes. That is the... Uh, yes. Is it we put too much effort or, or is it? No, most of the time we're, we're very tired yeah? Yeah. from our daily life. Uh, yeah. Because I find that if I am very busy, with a lot of work, I go many places, uh, and sometimes when I... Um, go back to my kuti yeah, to sit down and meditate yeah. sometimes I'm very relaxed yeah. I'm not, I mean I'm very restless so I sometimes tend to fall asleep so sometimes I need to rest first when I'm fully really rested then it's easy to be mindful of the body yeah. and then mindful of breath yeah. so it's something that is um, we say our lifestyle that we live in these days yeah, actually the mind the demand a lot from us uh, yep so i i find that if i'm in a very busy environment uh, it's, it it can take a bit more time to calm the mind down yep and being monastic and being meditating for a while uh, i can tell if the body my body is still really tired uh, and the mind not settled yet so that way if i need to and I, I have a rest first because in the um, when we do have a meditation retreat, la, sometimes we tell the retreatant if they need to, la, they can sleep in the morning, sleep in the afternoon. Then the next day, eh, they get more energy back. Eh. Then it's easier to wash the mind. Eh. Yeah. So everyone is different. Eh. Yeah. So so I presume you will be more effective if you. I mean, you slow down, probably yes. half a day or a few. You have to have a pre pre sort of create a pre-environment no, to slow everything down probably half a day not doing anything then probably be more effective if you straight away come from work or, or, or you have been running around for the last few hours so I presume it's not it will create this sort of disturbances isn't yes, it? yes yes that's true okay but I heard a story of, of a um, when the supporters invited Ajahn Chala to America uh, to stay um, in one of the supporters' house, uh, when he arrived, uh, he was so tired. Uh, basically, he slept um, all through the day, uh, in the morning, and also in the afternoon. Uh. So the supporters say he basically slept like a baby. Uh. So the next day, he was back to normal. Uh. So even um, monastic, that's very fast in meditation. Uh. So as they get older, uh, yeah, sometimes they, they need to rest the body. Uh. Yeah. So everyone will have the same problem. Yep, we do need time and time to rest the body. Okay. Thank you, my day. Yeah, maybe also sometimes we are just not patient enough. Yeah. Patience is really, really important. <laughs> and um, instead of facilitating the relaxation to become deeper, we actually disturb the process because we're like, oh, I'm not as still as I want to be. <laughs> so one of the similes that Ajahn Brahm uses is like the simile of sound. So the sound comes into a room and if the room has no insulation in it to absorb the sound, to slow the sound down, then it just bounces all over the place. And uh, I've noticed that, you know, in this building, there is actually you know, a lot of effort must have gone into insulating the room. So you actually come in and even if you try to be noisy, 
The noise doesn't last very long. It tends to get absorbed by the walls or by the phone or by the curtains or by the people and the cushions. And when we learn to have that same process in meditation or in our, in our daily lives, then uh, the busyness and the thoughts will actually, um, we allow them to be absorbed by the stillness and by the peace, by the material that slows them down. So the walls and the hardness of the wall is kind of like our harshness and our you know, irritation. But then the softness of the material is the softness of the mind and the patience. And then we just wait. And if we are a little bit mindful, we will realize we gained a little bit of peace. And if we rejoice in that, then it will grow over time. So that, that is really, really important. But you had a very good point, you know, I mean, the mind we have in day-to-day -day life is the same mind we bring into meditation. So if we think we can do whatever we want in life, and then we just bring into meditation and we'll fix the problem, <laughs> it's not going to work. So we have to take care of the mind already to some degree. And every now and then just check in and see, am I tense? Are my thoughts racing? Can I do something to calm the whole thing down? Can I focus on something which is calming rather than stimulating, rather than making the problem worse? And then we come to the meditation cushion and we've already put some practice in. And then it's easier. Yeah. But very often yeah, you get tired. Very often, you, if you do body scans, you just stay with the body. And that's all you can do. But it's so important what Bhantachunda did at the end of the meditation, and that's basically what Ajahn Brahm teaches us. Always remember and feel the difference, and then you will know why you're practicing, what the benefit is. And then you will be more inclined to do it again, not as a chore, but because you know it's good for you. You have an intrinsic, intrinsic motivation, so you don't have to kind of force yourself and say, no, you have to sit like, I need to sit, <laughs> because I need a break, I need some relaxation. Hi, hi Bhante, uh, I've got a, a very uh, basic kindergarten level question. Okay. I was a primary school teacher in the past. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, uh, I read that um, some people can meditate, can get into such deep states that they can just sit there for days meditating, yeah? So, does that mean that they don't have any bodily sensations? Because, okay, to be honest, right, just now when I was sitting down, I think I was quite calm, but I could feel my body getting tense here and there, so did I do it wrong? You know, kindergarten question here. <laughs> it's quite normal eh, to, um, to still feel the body eh, because we, we, we put so much effort eh, to um, take care of this body, exercise, eat well, uh, wear good clothes. Um, like we, the attachment to this body eh, for us is very strong. So it does take time eh, for us to let go of this body. That's what I find in um, my experience with other practitioners. Um, one thing I find that um, when I do a retreat eh, or speak to some retreatants, eh, I find that people that they can drop the body eh, are the ones that like, basically have cancer all over the body eh, and the body is so painful. Eh, under a lot of pain and because there's a lot of pain it becomes a great object so if they can watch the pain and don't react to it they turn the body disappear once it disappears then they find a lot of peace and a lot of pity not holding on this body yep so letting go of the body is one of the hardest things so that's why 
if we, I, not myself, I like to teach our body scanning. Eh? If we can relax this body, the more we can relax, relax it, eh? then we can let it go. So sometimes a lot of um, um, older people, eh? or Westerners, they find that if they sit on the floor, it's very hard to um, basically um, let go of this body. Yeah? Because there's always a disturption, disturbance, because we tend to move around, and when we move, we feel the body. Yeah? Yeah, but sometimes if you sit in the chair and you tend to move around, then after a while your body will slowly, slowly fade away. Yeah. yeah. But biologically, right? Mm -hmm. When you sit too long, you get tense and numb and yes. pins and needles. Yes. Yes. So are we supposed? Can are we allowed to wriggle our toes yes, or you can. move a bit? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do that, yeah. yes. Please, please do that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Try, next time, maybe try sitting in the chair and see see what's the result. Right? See, stupid yeah. question, right? Yeah, because I find that when I first started meditation, I sit on the chair, and I got really good result. Right? When the body become very calm and disappear, right? and once the body disappear, it was so delightful right? that I just enjoy um, having a peaceful mind right? and not having this body around. Because this body can be a, a big burden right? to carry around. Right? Because um, as you're saying that why some people can sit for so long, for like a whole day, yeah? if they do get into a very deep meditation, where the um, the mind will rise naturally, yeah? then um, it can be very delightful. So, the if we sit quite steadily, and uh, our five senses disappear, and the mind become very calm and very peaceful, and sometimes um, and very still. Yeah? So when the mind is very calm and very peaceful and still, eh, then you start to see the, um, the radiant mind slowly arise. So this radiant mind eh, is actually very common eh, because when most people die, eh, they always describe seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Eh. So if you ever um, look at some near-death experience, eh, what people describe eh, when they have an accident or when they die in the hospital or they somehow just pass away and come back, eh, and sometimes they describe they seeing this, they're in a dark place, and they um they see this light that arise in the mind. So um, with people that have lived that experience, it's very actually quite common. But for meditators, if we can learn to still the body and still the mind, and um, if all the condition is right here, then yeah, then you can see the radiant mind. So that's kind of advantage of being a practitioner, and um. If you come out from um, a deep mind meditation uh, with a still mind, uh, then uh, yeah, you can use uh, the radiant mind uh, to um, develop wisdom. So when you look at the Buddha, the Buddha Rupa, we oft offer flowers that remind us of impermanent. That instead is to remind us of um, virtue, uh, but the light is to remind us to cultivate the pure heart, the pure mind. Uh, so when the mind is pure and bright, yeah, then you can use that to develop wisdom. We call it the light of wisdom. Yeah. So yeah, so to have a pure heart, yeah, you need to keep pretty good sealer. So people that have um, have negative experience, so if they could if they are a good person, then they are a kind person, then what they see is a um, radiant pure mind. Yeah. So you can always check in the internet, there's lots of many different stories about it. Thank you. It's also something you kind of have to get used to. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, but uh, once you start to experience it, you just have to accept it. <laughs> because our understanding is that we have to hold our body in order to sit still. But in meditation, we will realize the more we practice that we can allow our body to be supported by the chair that we can allow our muscles and our bones to kind of like hang on the, on the spine without us having to put in the effort which creates the tension and which creates the problem. So there will come a point in meditation where um, you can kind of give over to your body and say, you know, body just sit in whatever posture you need to sit and the body takes care of the process by itself and then the mind doesn't have to worry about the body and it separates
from the body. And the body is fine. And the body is not being pushed, and it's not being pulled, and it's not being held. And that's why when people come out of long sits that are not forced, the body feels great. Because it being, it's just being left alone. So a little bit of a simile, it's not exactly the same, but when you're lying in bed, and you're trying to relax your body so, so, you know, with so much force, you're actually stopping yourself from sleeping. So you have to basically allow your body to lie on the mattress, to be carried by the mattress, to, you know, sink into the mattress. And then it doesn't register anymore. There is no problem. And then the mind can go off into sleep. And it's similar in meditation. The mind knows there is no worry about the body. And that's why we have to take care of the body in sitting on a chair in the beginning and then being very really kind and making sure it's relaxed. But um, yeah, I hope that <laughs> over time you will understand what we're talking about. I am so blessed uh, this evening uh, to be here listening to a very good meditation talk. I really benefited. Actually, I meant to go home earlier, but I stayed on because uh, it was really very uh, enlightening. Now, um, very easy la, for your monastic. You have nothing to do <laughs> in the forest. You can meditate. I'm talking about people like who are housewife, okay? They 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 need to be uh, working around not just housewife but also people who are working i remember uh buddha told one housewife never mind you're busy but you can still meditate uh, this is the part uh, i would like to know how uh, the buddha meant that even you are busy with your chores you can still meditate Ah, uh, this is the part I want to learn. Thank you. <coughs> um, so it, it does take time. Eh? So when when I was a lay person, I used to um, go to the monastery quite often during the weekend. Um, and um, after lunch, I'll sit in the Dharma hall and just sit for meditation for like maybe one or two hours, and really enjoy the the um, the quietness of the monastery. For anyone that has been to Bodhiyana Monastery, if you go to the Dharma Hall, it's very quiet and very peaceful. So, uh, yeah, so the hall at uh, Bodhiyana does have a lot of energy. Uh, yeah. So once you uh, develop that kind of calm and peace in one's heart, then um, when you go back home, then it, somehow your mind remember uh, how peaceful the, the moment was. Uh, in the monastery, because I used to go to the monastery quite often, uh, just to um, improve my meditation. But because once it's, it's um, the stillness is there, and you get a lot of joy and happiness, having a quiet mind, uh, a mind that's not like a monkey mind going all over the place. Uh, because a lot of mon- a monkey mind for me, in the beginning, gave me a lot of anxiety and stress and worry. Uh, and actually, it stress so um, affected my health. So when I learned to calm the mind down and make it peaceful, I, I was more happier. But I find that my health actually improved a lot. And I go, wow, this meditation actually worked. Yeah. So that's why I got, I really enjoyed meditation when I was a lay person. And I used to, um, after lunch, I would sit in my car and just meditate for 10 minutes. And I calm the mind more, I go back to work, and my employer will put me in any machines out of the factory and I can manage to um, increase the production of the machines. And um, yeah, so I was just very mindful, watching, making the machines running properly and the materials going into the machine properly. So I remember one time after paying off, off all my debts, I told my um, supervisor that I'm going to um, resign and I'm um, going to do some religious study up in the monastery. And my supervisor at the time told me, 
Kim, don't go. Just stay. Work with the company. Why are you going? I say, oh, I need to do some religious study. Yeah? Um, so I might be away for one year. Like. But before I left, he told me one thing. Yeah. He says, oh, so many people yeah, that he worked with, yeah, he find that I was the most calmness yeah, and the most peaceful. Yeah. Because people was working there, long hours, double shift, um, and they not steady. Like, it's like they're always complaining yeah, or anxious. Yeah. But he found that I was calm and peaceful yeah, and still managed to um, do a lot of um, work yeah, and tasks quite easily. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, my supervisor told me, yeah, I actually made him quite peaceful yeah, because I was quite relaxed yeah, and also efficient. Yeah. So yeah, it takes time to um, train the mind yeah, to be calm and mindful. But once the mind is mindful, yeah, then you can basically um, um, be become a very efficient worker. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I, I do recall uh, I came on one of my first uh, teachers over in Germany. She, she would say, you know, people go to work and some of the work is not very physical. And they sit down at the table and they, you know, move a pencil up and down. Maybe back in those days, now you are <laughs> using the computer and, and watching the screen. But they come back home and they're really tired. Why are they so tired? <laughs> it's the mind which gets tired. It's the thinking, it's the resisting, it's the forcing, it's the trying to get ahead. If we could just feel more and be more and just do whatever we need to do and be with the movement or be with the job or if that is difficult, somehow bring the mind to something which uplifts it, which gives it energy, which makes it happy, rather than draining it of energy, rather than you know thinking about some negative things that might be happening and having those running in our mind at the same time. Just being with the task and trying to maintain that. Sometimes what I feel, what helps me is to understand why I'm doing the work, who I'm doing the work for, and thinking that those people will appreciate it and that I care deeply for those people and that's why I'm doing this job. And that will uplift the mind, that will give it energy rather than draining it of energy. And uh, to stay with the movement of whatever the movement is. And <laughs> I was doing some house, house chores recently at Kusala Hermitage, that's the place where I'm staying. They build a granny flat, they call it, which is like a building on the property um, that you can build without getting too much you know, um, hassle with building approval and all that. And we got some curtains. <laughs> and uh, they, were, they told me to wash the curtains and to iron all the curtains. And my goodness, I can't remember how many, but we have like, you know, a lot of curtains. And one curtain, um, it depends which one it was. Um, one was plastified, so you couldn't use a lot of heat. And that took 45 minutes for one <laughs> one curtain. So I could really watch my mind and I could watch my body, <coughs> what it was doing and how it was tensing up and how it was not, you know, liking the job and how I almost, I almost got blisters at some stage from holding the iron. <laughs> so I had to make sure that I take breaks and that I don't fall into negative mind states that I just do the job. <laughs> and I think the breaks are one of the things that are most important. So if we take a break and put down whatever we are doing, then all that tension that has built up can seep away, even if it's just five minutes. Have a cup of tea or sit down and breathe a little bit, relax your body and then get back to the chore. Then you will uh, realize that that tension that is building up and the negativity that is building up is kind of like um, interrupted. So I hope that helps. See how it goes.
for uh, meditation, is it okay to combine uh, breathing as well as recollection methods at the same time? to do it so much, but um, probably there wouldn't be anything wrong with it. You know, if the breath is something which is easily accessible for you, for example, and if it's something which steadies and calms your mind, then you go to that and then go to a contemplation or to a reflection and then go back and forth. Is that what, what you're kind of suggesting? Or yeah. are you saying, you know, I'm breathing in and then thinking about a certain subject and breathing out, think, thinking about a certain subject? Um, more of a combination, which is breathing in, then sometimes you may then go to the recollection method. Right. So right. kind of a combination of both. Yes, yes. Um, I have to try it out and see if, it, uh, if you feel it, it distracts the mind. Um, probably I mean, it's, it's nice if we can let the mind settle and rest on a certain object for a longer period of time. That's probably the thought that comes up for me. Because um, if we go back and forth too much, um, we can't really gain that calm and steadiness and settledness. But, um, I mean, when you were talking about it, you know, when we meditate, and we have just like one word, like breathing in peace, breathing out, let go. And that might be okay in the beginning stages, yeah, for contemplation. Probably best to leave it for a little bit later, when the mind is, is a bit still and a bit calm. And then also, is, is it contemplation or is it, um, uh, what, what was the word you used? Uh, recollection. Recollection, okay, yes. So would you recollect like the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, or um, Sila, or uh, Chaga? Or yeah, re recollection of your good deeds. Of good deeds, yes, yeah. so that would be Sila, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, with the recollections, maybe something I can offer is I often use the simile of a singing bowl. So the bringing up of the thought or the bringing up of the kind of object is like hitting the ball but what you are after is not hitting the ball all the time <laughs> you're actually after the resonating of the ball you're after the feeling that arises you're after feeling and understanding what that thing is you are thinking about so you might bring up the thought I've done something really beautiful, but then you want to make sure you don't don't just keep repeating <laughs> that thought. Mm -hmm. You actually want to feel what the reason what what resonates in your heart, and that's what the recollections are actually about. So it uplifts your heart, it fills your heart, it has a certain flavor, and you want to make sure that you really savor the flavor rather than just keeping eating it. <laughs> I don't know, I hope these similes make sense. Yeah, I, I don't know. Other children might have some other things to offer. Okay, is... Uh, I'll think in mind. Um, if there's less defilements in the mind, like greed and anger, so if the mind is more purified, the more pure the mind is, then um, with that reflection, um, you can gain more wisdom. So what I mean is like, if, if, if the mind is very calm and peaceful through meditation, it's like you, you know, but it's just a silent knowing. There's no thinking yet. Like the thinking is like in the background. Yep. So when you see something, you know. So it's hard to describe. Eh? It's like when the mind is very calm, and very peaceful, and you look at things, uh, you, you constantly know, uh, but without the endless thinking uh, and doubting, uh, 
Yeah. So that's the best way to reflect on things that uh, your mind is pure uh, and uh, and free from defilements. Yeah. So if you have done a retreat before, a long retreat, and you find that after the like after three or seven days, after you finish retreat, your mind is more clear. Uh, you can uh, things that happen, uh, you can reflect on it more clearly uh, and make more sense. Like things like it's like when you have a problem, you think about it a lot. Then the next day you sleep. The next day you wake up with a clear mind. Uh, the answer to the problem becomes very simple uh, and not a big problem. So when the mind is clear, uh, free from defilements, uh, then when you reflect, uh, you can understand things more clearly through wisdom. Uh. So I don't know. I hope that makes sense. Uh. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, now we're getting close to the sun time, but if there is one last question, there's always one last question. <laughs> but um, what we usually do is we do stay back, so we don't want to hold people back. Who need to go? So you can come to speak to us um, in the middle of the talk if there is anything you wish to ask, discuss, or, or share. Shall we finish? Or is there anything else? Uh, yes, yeah, since Ajahn, you opened up for one last question, I will ask you know, one last question. Uh, Ajahn Brahmali has this, uh, whenever he teaches us, uh, he always says, um, don't go straight to the breath yet. And he says, uh, just, just, uh, just, uh, what was the word he used? Uh, be, sit a while and just, just sort of just naturally let the mind sort of settle down without actually looking for anything. Uh, sometimes for me, for example, it works. Sometimes it does not uh, because especially when the mind is very, very un unsettled and then you're trying to just sit there and then you're trying to let the mind and then there it goes it goes into into so what are your th advice on this uh, what, what would be the good take thing to start with and then how how does it transition then to maybe to the breath uh, because that's what Ajahn Brahmali always try to tell us to just just uh, sit it like sitting in an armchair not not to do anything and then allow the mind to naturally sort of, sort of come to the um, to the breath eventually. Shall I? Okay. Are you good? Okay. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, um, <coughs> I, I I just really like similes because <laughs> they kind of make make sense to a lot of people. So, um, Ajahn Brahm gives us a simile of the different objects, and some of them are more coarse and some of them are finer. So you want to make sure that the mind and the object the mind is watching are about the same amount, m amount of roughness or of, of, of refinement. So he says it's like when you have a piece of wood and you start working on it, you have to you know, chop it and then you have to start using you know, sandpapers that are that are very coarse, and then you have the, the smooth sandpaper, and then right at the end you actually take out the cloth and you start oiling the, this piece of wood, which is almost, you know, done. And the breath is very, very subtle. And if the mind is not subtle enough, then it's like taking one of those microfiber cloths to, a, you know, just cut off um, piece of wood and nothing happens, it just gets stuck in it. So we have to become very, very skillful. So what I like doing and what I would rec recommend is if we are really, really busy, it's good to give the mind something to do, but to give it something to do which calms it down slowly and moves it in the right direction. And walking meditation is, for example, something beautiful there because your senses are still active, and the mind, you know, is not sleepy, 
it gets less distracted because it's got something to do and then you already develop a little bit of, of, of stillness, a little bit of peace. And then you do the body scans that we teach and with those body scans the kindness and the wakefulness and all these things start arising so your mind becomes more subtle and then it's easier to see the breath, to invite the breath or even to wait for the breath. The best thing is to wait for the breath if you can at all. Again, it's patience, <laughs> but uh, patience, as Ajahn Brahm says, is the fastest way. <laughs> yeah, yes, so patience is something that may be developed. So walking meditation is actually quite beneficial. So sometimes if our mind is too very busy, we, we need to bring the awareness to our walking meditation. So when we walk back and forward, um, it takes a while for the mind to calm down. So if we're doing something, then the awareness will slowly bring to our feet, touching left and right. Yeah? And that's the whole motion of walking meditation. As, as the awareness goes into the feet, and as the mind becomes more calm, and more peaceful, then what some people that love doing walking meditation say is after a while they feel like it's just automatic walking back and forward and they feel like they're floating while walking back and forward. So once the mind is very calm and relaxed, then it's good to uh, sit down and, and um, stay with the breath in the body. So walking meditation is a great way of really calming down the mind because if we come from a very busy environment and uh, we're very active, then um, when we sit down there, then the mind will it's not, not to be, it's not required. So sometimes you need that energy to go somewhere. Though. So walking meditation is a great way to channel those intense energy just to down to the motion of walking. Yeah. Because sometimes walking is a great way of just letting those energy go. Though and just let it come in the body and just bring the mindfulness to the body. Yeah. yeah. Hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Any... Mm? <laughs> okay. So, thank, thank you, Bhante, for the uh, meditation session, the Q&A. There are some, uh, if those who wish to offer requisites to the monks, there are some Ang Pao wrappers at the back. You can uh, just put it there, then you will transfer it to Bodhiyana Monastery. And uh, if those who like, still like to join the Thursday meditation session, that is a whole day retreat, uh, please let me know. Okay. So, Maybe I can say a little bit more. So we'll be looking at the Brahma Viharas, the four ideal attitudes. So there will be some talks and some slides for um, those things, but we will also be meditating together um, for you know, about 45 minutes at a time. So throughout the whole day, starting at 8.30 and finishing at 6, I think, is that right? Yes. So if anyone is inclined to join us, um, please feel free to do so. Okay. Would you like to share merits? Oh, wow. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we are not, not very big into, into that thing. Yeah. <coughs> well, which one do you usually do? <laughs> Sukito Hotunya Tayo, Hidam Hunya Tinam Hotu, Sukita Hotunya Tayo. So, all the merits we have gained through all the good things we've done, through listening to the Dhamma, through practicing the Dhamma, through sharing the Dhamma, we um, don't let them just and rejoice, uh, let them just um, um, <coughs> give joy to our own hearts, but we let them also overflow to all the other beings that uh, need some of that joy and happiness as well, to rejoice with us.